Why would anybody else be able to dictate to you what you should do with your life? That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But what's the next step after that? Your parents can't tell you what to do. The school can't tell you what to do. Your mentor can't tell you what to do. The next thing is, you can't tell you what to do. Yourself has now become a demon. And it will eat you. I just saw this ad. I told myself to remember it, but I don't. It has something about some skin treatment because your skin deserves it. Now, we've spoken about this before. These advertisements that sell every product in the world on the basis that you deserve. You deserve to have a good night's sleep. You deserve to have beautiful hair. Now, your skin deserves. We're getting a little ridiculous here. Your skin deserves to be beautiful or moist. I don't know what it is. Then. The worship of self. Very popular idol and very destructive. The worship of self is actually promoted not only by the media, but also by experts, authorities. To be healthy, you must have a high self-image. You must put yourself first. Looking out for number one. That was an old book. Number one being you. Parents tell their children without any shame. I come first. I need my time now. I have to take care of myself first. And although that's true, I mean, if a mother said, do I take a nap when I'm exhausted or do I have to continue to play with the kids? You say, well, of course, you have to take the nap because you got to be a healthy mother. That doesn't mean you come first. It means your children come first. And they need a healthy mother. This worship of self is embarrassing. It not only violates some divine law, it violates the dignity of a human being. It goes against the grain of what is human, which is another aspect of idolatry. Idolatry is not only an affront to God, because he is a jealous God. Idolatry is even an affront to the human condition. How do you reduce yourself from the highest of God's creations to a miserable dependency on something lower than yourself, less talented, less able, less capable. So to make yourself dependent on something inferior to yourself, that's an insult to the human condition. This pursuit of self is not the self that makes us human. It's the self that makes us weak. So here's the positive and the negative side of self. There's a side of self that is dignified, that is inspiring, challenging. You're a human being. That's a compliment to be taken seriously. With being human come certain obligations. 
certain uh, responsibilities. One of the first responsibilities is to protect the dignity of the human condition. So there are actually commandments that don't allow you to degrade yourself. There's a prohibition against doing things that are distasteful, degrading, embarrassing to the human condition. That's the positive side of the self. The self that makes us moral. The self that demands better, higher, greater achievement, fulfillment, purpose. That self is the kosher self. The self that is being promoted in the media, that's our weaker self. Obey your thirst. No. Your thirst should obey you. You decide when you drink. You decide what you drink. You decide where you drink. Your thirst obeys you. You are not your thirst. And you certainly don't worship your thirst. So this worship of self I actually heard this again recently. It was related to Yom Kippur. And this, um, this little clip, this little video that they put together, some educational institution. Why is it that we keep asking for forgiveness? Over and over and over in the 24 hours of Yom Kippur. We ask forgiveness for sins we don't even understand. You need commentary on the list of sins. Well, what sin is that? Well, how is that different than the other sin? You need to sit and study this. These are deep sins. And yet we keep asking the same list over and over and over. So he says, why, why is that? I mean, even Jewish guilt has to have a limit. His answer basically is that it shows the fact that we are asking forgiveness for what seems to be petty sins <coughs> shows that our behavior, our actions, are important to God. So rather than seeing this constant, repeated uh, refrain, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, as a negative, as a critical statement about ourselves, we should see it in a more positive light. It shows that even these little things are important to God, and we actually have to apologize for it because it makes a difference to him. And it was all sounding very nice until the end when he came to his punchline. His conclusion is, the reason we keep asking for forgiveness is so that we will learn to believe in ourselves. How is that for Yom Kippur? See, it turns out that all the davening of Yom Kippur, all the praying on Yom Kippur, is really uh, a self-help group therapy session. So that you would come, around, come away believing in your own importance. Do you see how tricky that is? How sneaky? It was all sounding good until the last line. And then all of a sudden, instead of being focused on God, it became the self. If you have to apologize for the things you carelessly said, see how important you are?
Imagine a husband apologizes to his wife. I'm really sorry I made that nasty comment to you the other day. I'm way more important than that. It was inappropriate of me to do that because I'm a really important person. I shouldn't be saying things like that. This marriage is in trouble. There's a self that elevates and there's a self that degrades. If we're focused on the noble self, then we are being holy. That's the godly thing. If we focus on the self that diminishes and degrades us, then we're worshiping an idol. Let's ask a very fundamental question. Is worshiping a good thing or a bad thing? If you worship an idol, it's the worst thing in the world. But if you worship God, it's the best thing in the world. What is it? Is worship good or bad? If you worship an idol, you're degrading yourself. Why, why are you groveling? Why are you submitting your will and your intelligence and your choices to the dictates of a statue? Of a ridiculous religion? Where is your pride? Where is your self-respect? You're, you're an agent of free will. You have your own intelligence. Don't give all that up and worship something or someone. Oh, but if you're worshiping God, well, yeah, then it's great. Give up your opinion. Give up your freedom of choice. Give up everything. Just do everything he tells you. His way. All the time. That's great. Is worship a good thing or a bad thing? Why is it wonderful in one instance and terrible in the other? So going back again to those first two commandments of the Ten Commandments, I am God, your God, you shall have no other gods. The message there is the same thing can be wonderful if it's on the right side, terrible if it's on the wrong side. What is that thing? Worship. Belief. If you adore the right things, you're great. You adore the wrong things, you're, you're a miserable disgrace. Idolatry. So what is it? Is it good to worship or is it not good to worship? Or in simple language, why is it okay to worship God? What happened to your freedom of choice? Where is your self-respect? Where is your individuality? Where is your dignity? Why is God allowed to dictate your behavior? The truth is, it's not just God. Your parents can dictate your behavior too, at least up to a certain age. Your teachers dictate your behavior, and that's as it should be. A mentor, a coach. A sergeant in the army. Oh, they dictate your behavior down to the petty details. And if you follow carefully, you're a good soldier, not a disgrace. So what is the rule of, the rule of thumb? When is it good? When is it bad? Very simply. If it elevates you, it's wonderful. If it degrades you, it's wrong. A human being 
is like in the middle. I think even in terms of size. The macrocosm, the universe, is as large, as, as greater than the human being as the human being is greater than the, mic- the micro subatomic particle. Equal distance. So the human being is right in the middle between huge and tiny. The challenge is, which direction are you going in? To remain in the middle is not a purpose. That's not a goal. That's senseless. So a human being is always in flux. He's either rising or falling. He's either growing or deteriorating. Worship is a very powerful tool. If you worship the right thing, it elevates you dramatically. If you worship the wrong thing, it degrades you dramatically. So the greatest elevation, the greatest, most noble achievement of a human being comes through worship. And the greatest degradation, the vilest form of self-abuse is idolatry. Because worship is powerful. When you worship something, you actually attain certain qualities certain characteristics of that which you are worshipping. By worshipping God, you, you become godly. By worshipping what is beneath you, you become that. More so than through any other... You study a subject, you kind of move in that direction. When, when math starts to really make sense to you, you're, you're moving towards that world. When uh, hedonism is starting to look attractive, you're becoming that. But only to a certain degree, as far as your mind can take you. But when you worship it, you're giving it your, your soul. So you're, you're absorbing it You're being absorbed in it far more than if you study it or you talk about it or think about it. When you worship it, you're dissolving into it. You're literally becoming it. That's why we have to be so careful not to worship the wrong thing. Even even more than not to eat the wrong thing or not to say the wrong thing, or even not to think the wrong thing, but to worship the wrong thing, that really is a total surrender to something unworthy and beneath you. When you worship God, it it ennobles you. It elevates you to the highest conditions that a human being can achieve. So what is the rule of thumb? Worship is acceptable if it elevates you. It is forbidden if it degrades you. So in a sense, worshiping God is not selfish, but it is also not a denial of self. Surrendering your will to God is not suicidal. It enhances your being. But you do that through surrender. Of course, the same is true with marriage. The mutual surrender of husband to wife does not diminish them, but actually ennobles them, elevates them. So, 
Worship means surrender. To adore something means you're surrendering to it. To worship something means you bend your knee, you submit, or if you're very religious, you fall on your face, not just bend your knee. Which means you submit totally to a, to a will, to the dictates of something other than you. If those dictates, if that something is greater than you, then you are doing exactly what a human being is meant to do. Become something more than human. That's not destructive of self. That's elevation of self. But if you worship something beneath you, if you surrender to something less worthy than you, then you are destroying the human condition. You're degrading the human condition and adding power and energy to things that are unholy. One of the problems with idolatry, which needs a, a bit of explanation because what does it mean you shall have no other gods? There are no other gods. How can you worship other gods? There aren't any. So even calling it a false god seems inappropriate. Not a false god, he's just a statue. The sun is not a false god, it's just the sun. So even saying false god is a little too much of a compliment. He's not a false god, he's just a planet. So what is the damage of worshipping a statue? I mean, you're making a fool of yourself. But, but so what? Who cares? What's, what's the harm? I was talking to some guy who messed up his life. And he's sitting there on Rosh Hashanah and he's thinking, how do I do tshuva for this? How do I repent for this? And of course, there was no way to repent for it because it was simply a dumb thing to do. <laughs> and as sad as this may sound, there is no repentance for stupidity. You can't get forgiveness for stupidity. Stupidity just has to be cured, not forgiven. It's okay, I forgive you, you can continue to be stupid. No, no, there's no forgiveness for stupid. So if idolatry is as ridiculous as it sounds, it shouldn't be a sin. And there's no forgiveness for it, it's just stupid. And yet it is the biggest sin, the most horrendous sin, idolatry. Why? It's just being silly. When the Jews made the golden calf, Moshe argued for God, with God, for forgiveness. And he said, God, why are you angry with your people? And God said, what kind of question is that? I just told them not to make graven images, and now they're bowing to a cow. It's a long story, but the punchline was Moses said, a cow? What's a cow? A cow is your creation. It can't do anything by itself. So what are they bowing to? Nothing. What are you angry about? What is it, like they found another god? It's a cow. Bowing to a cow is pretty embarrassing and silly, but what are you angry about? So what is the damage of idolatry? Part of the damage, the gift, the talent, the, 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 the ability to worship is so powerful that if you worship the wrong thing, 
you're actually empowering it. It itself is nothing, meaningless. But if you worship it, you give it power. You are feeding evil. You're nurturing the evil. You've become its valet. Again, more so than if you talked about it or if you uh, if you did certain acts of worship, the worship itself is so much more powerful than an act or a thought or a spoken word. And so when you give your worshipfulness to something that doesn't deserve it, you're putting energy into darkness. You're empowering the evil because worship energy is so powerful. When people put their trust in another human being, that human being becomes powerful. That's a fact. If you are appointed to a position of leadership, your, your, your talents expand. You become capable of things you wouldn't be able to do as a private citizen. But because of the input from a large group of people, their trust and their faith in you changes you. Now imagine people put their trust into an evil person. How powerful that person becomes. So Hitler, for example, was not as an individual, as a private citizen, he was not a powerful force. But when people worshipped him, when people put all their trust in him, when people surrendered their energies to him, he became monstrously effective. So the worship of the people turned him into a Hitler. Otherwise, he was just a dropout loser. So putting your faith, your worship, into something other than God is empowering, it nurtures, it gives strength to that which shouldn't have strength. And that's the violation of idolatry. The more you feed yourself, the more you cater to this self, the more powerful it becomes until yourself becomes more powerful than you. And you've created a Frankenstein because now you can't control yourself. You're no longer the master of your ship or the, cap the captain of your ship and the master of your fate. You are now a victim of your own self. One of our teachers once explained it to us. He said, look what happens when you don't, when you don't accept the rules, the advice. At first, you become an independent self. You don't have to listen to your parents. Your parents are not the boss of you. You are now yourself. Then you come to school. Well, the school is not the boss of you. The principal can't tell you what to do. Because you are yourself. You got to be yourself. You got to be me. Got to do it my way. Then your mentor, your mashpia, 
can't really tell you what to do because uh, you are you. Why would anybody else be able to dictate to you what you should do with your life? That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But what's the next step after that? Your parents can't tell you what to do. The school can't tell you what to do. Your mentor can't tell you what to do. The next thing is, you can't tell you what to do. Yourself has now become a demon. And it will eat you. So here you thought, I'm becoming healthier, I'm becoming more independent, I'm becoming more myself. And all of a sudden, yourself runs away on you and becomes independent of you. Even you can't tell it what to do. And then you find people saying, I know I should, but I, I can't. Yeah, I want to, but I, I can't. I make New Year's resolutions, but the, myself doesn't listen to me can't talk to it. It's become a monster. So this self that we empower by feeding it, by indulging it, and then by worshiping it, it's out of control. You have fed it. You have strengthened it to the point where it is now stronger than you. So what is the danger of an idol when there really are no idols? The danger is this non-entity can become a powerful force of evil because you are pumping it full of energy and life by giving it your worship, your adoration. So by itself, it really would be nothing. It's a cow. But if you worship a cow, who knows what kind of monster you're going to turn that into. Sacred cows. You take a cow, you make it sacred, and then it tells you what to do. So the self can be the most powerful and evil false god. Because we're empowering it constantly. Every time you eat, every time you drink, every time you take a rest, every time, whatever you do to pamper yourself, you're making it more unreasonable, more demanding, more of a dictator, because it believes the worship that you offer. It takes itself very seriously. So what does it mean to worship God? You can't empower God. You're not going to make God more powerful by worshiping him. You're not investing him with energy or strength or influence that he should not have or would not have without you. By worshiping God, you're doing the opposite. You're empowering your human condition by making it more godlike. But don't come to the conclusion that that proves how important you are. I don't even know how the mind does that. If I can acquire some godliness, if I can become more like God, then I will be more important. Where's the logic there? If, if you become more like God, that's great. Why? Because God is important. And if you're a little more like him, that's great, because being like him is important. How did you become important? That's like, if I can feed the poor, if I can cure the sick, that'll make me very important. No, it wouldn't. The virtue of 
feeding the poor is because they're important, not you. Otherwise, why are you ennobled by feeding them? Because they're more important than you. So if you can do something for them, you can become almost as important as they. The self is very nasty. It'll turn everything upside down. So if you're the teacher, obviously you're the more important person. No, you're not. All you're good for is to teach them because they're important or the knowledge is important. So when God said to Moshe, pass the leadership on to Joshua, to Yeshua, he said, you think I'm giving you authority? I'm enslaving you to the people. Being the leader makes you the slave. Not more important, less important. And that ennobles you. Because it is more important. And if you can become as important as it, that's good. Because it is important. How do we use our self for improvement rather than degradation? So a little cartoon. These two women are walking and one of them says, you know, between gym and Pilates and yoga and um, what is the other thing? Some other and meditation. I have no time for myself. Gym is not for yourself. Pilates is not for yourself. Yoga is not for yourself. Meditation is not for yourself. Which self are you talking about? You do all of those things, you have no time for yourself. Unless it means I have no time to be by myself. Which is a problem. But what would you do if you were by yourself? What would you even say to yourself? Then you would complain that you're bored. Because talking to yourself is boring. What is a healthy self? Self-improvement. Going to the gym is not self-improvement. It's improvement of self. There's a difference. Self-improvement is the opposite of improvement of self. Improvement of self means you're indulging your unhealthy self. You're worshiping something less than you. Self-improvement means elevating yourself to something greater than itself. Make sense? How do you improve yourself? By becoming more yourself? That's not an improvement. Be the best you can be. Is that self-improvement or is that just being self? Self-improvement means if yourself can become something other than itself. More, not less. How can yourself become anything more than yourself? Primarily through worshipping something greater than you. Because where your heart lies, that's where you are transported. To worship something means... To, to yield to it, to melt into it, it actually takes you there. You're becoming it. It's like, what do people yearn for? We're not always conscious, which is sad. We're not always conscious of what we yearn for. But everybody yearns for something. 
If you're yearning for something greater than yourself, that is self-improvement. That is elevation of self. If you yearn for something less noble and less important than yourself, then you're worshiping the unhealthy self. You're empowering the little monster that you're not going to be able to control. That's not self-improvement. That's just improvement of self, which is not good. So, as with happiness, although it's not a mitzvah, it is the, it is the bedrock on which all mitzvahs are built. The same is true also with self-respect. It's not a mitzvah, but it's crucial to everything noble. Should a Jew know that he is chosen, or are we better off not knowing? Wouldn't we be more humble if God never told us that we were chosen? Maybe. But God did tell us. So there must be a virtue to knowing. If you know yourself, then you know where you need to be. Self-knowledge is not self-worship. Self-knowledge is a fantastic tool, indispensable tool, for self-improvement. People who don't know themselves usually destroy themselves in their attempt to make things better. So God tells us that we are chosen because you have to know who you are in order to move either up or down the ladder. If you don't know who you are, you don't know where you are. You don't know whether you're going up or down. So God has to locate us by identifying us. You are a nation of priests. You are chosen. Now do your thing. But if we didn't know, we could spend our lives working at things that are not even our job and therefore not self-improvement. It'll almost always end up being improvement of self which is not productive. So we have to know that we are chosen. We have to know what responsibility we carry, what expectations God has of us as Jews. That's not arrogance. That's the tool for self-improvement. It does not lead to improvement of self. No one ever said, I'm going to the gym, I'm working out, I'm um, taking courses to improve myself because I'm chosen. I've never heard anybody say that. I've never heard anybody sign up for Pilates because they're chosen. Because Chosen doesn't take you in that direction. Chosen only takes you in one direction. And that is, now that you know you're chosen, you can only go up. Only self-improvement, not improvement of self. Because if you're chosen, you can't improve yourself. You can only reach for self-improvement. Partner with Rabbi Friedman. Visit itsgoodtoknow.org forward slash support.